Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kuba Turowski. Uh, I'm actually head of the uh, public policy uh, for Facebook here in, uh, in, uh, in Poland. Uh, today I'm going to have a slightly different role trying to uh, moderate and guide you in this wonderful topic we're going to gonna talk about. Um, maybe before I uh, introduce our great panelists and we really enter into the topic, I wanted to share with you a little anecdote uh, that I think reflects very well our topic today. Um, as a matter of fact, nobody's perfect, I'm a huge um, football fan. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, actually I'm a fan of a French team called Paris Saint-Germain. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, and now you must be thinking, where is this guy going? Um, and, like four years ago, uh, the team changed its owner. It's been purchased. Uh, and it's not been purchased by some millionaire, whatever. Uh, it's not been purchased by some broadcasting company whatsoever. It's been purchased by a country. It's been purchased by Qatar. Uh, and I think that's precisely what we're going to talk about today. Uh, how countries can use all these different soft tools to create their whole um, diplomacy. Uh, because uh, Qatar for sure did not purchase Paris Saint-Germain because they love Ronaldinho or whoever. Uh, but they just figured out that sports, football in Paris Saint-Germain can be really part of their diplomacy as a country. And so I think that's the kind of thing we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk about, with as a wonderful uh, starting point, uh, the reports uh, that Jonathan um, created uh, in cooperation with Facebook and with Elizabeth. Um, and afterwards, we're going to discuss um, this report and uh, our today's topic. But first of all, I would like maybe to introduce everybody uh, who's uh, on stage today with me. Um, so I would start with uh, Elizabeth Linda, uh, who's head of government and political outreach for Facebook in EMEA Zone. Um, Next to Elizabeth, we have Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan uh, from Portland is the author of our report today. Um, we have the great, great pleasure to have Sylvie Kaufmann, uh, editorial director from Le Monde, with us. And Krzysztof Blusch, uh, the CEO of one of the biggest world show think tanks, uh, Demos Europa. So thank you very much all for being here with us today. Um, I guess the best thing now is to leave the floor to Jonathan and to Elizabeth uh, who are going to present the report to us uh, and then we're going to have some panel discussion, hopefully also opening the floor to, uh, to you, to the public. So please Jonathan, thank you very much. So I, I want to just sort of set the context for, for the discussion uh, this afternoon and uh, talk a bit about the Soft Power 30, uh, which is the, the research project that um, uh, we worked on with, uh, with Facebook and with Elizabeth. Um, and just kind of talk through, uh, first of all, what is soft power, uh, and then discuss a bit about the, the, the soft power 30 itself, and then um, I'll touch briefly on the results and what it means for, for Poland, and then we'll, we'll get into discussion, and Elizabeth is going to talk a bit about the digital component of this, of this research project immediately after me. So I think it's really helpful uh, whenever discussing soft power to start with a definition of you know, what is soft power uh, and why does it matter. Um, and actually, if, if we start with a simple definition of what is power in international politics, uh, power is the ability of one actor to change the behavior of another actor, to get them to do something they would otherwise not have done, right? So just getting people to, to, to do what you want them to do. And traditionally, we could think about power in, in two ways. Uh, the first is hard power. So hard power re relies on uh, coercive strategies, things like using force or threat of force uh, or economic sanctions or simply paying people to, to do what you want them to do. But in contrast to hard power, soft power uses attraction and persuasion to, to change people's minds and, and ultimately change their behavior. And soft power as a concept was originally coined by Joseph Nye, a Harvard professor uh, who, who coined the term in 1990. 
Um, and he, he says there are three main sources of soft power and that is culture, and that can be high culture or it can be pop culture, um, it's uh, political values, so things like uh, human rights, democracy, free press. Um, and finally it's foreign policy and this is the extent to which a, a country is seen as acting with moral authority in the world. So that's kind of a, a definition of what, what soft power is relative to hard power. Um, so why does it matter? Well, in the report that, that we published, at, um, that we launched in Facebook's offices in London back in July, uh, we argue that there are two major trends in the world, two mega trends that, that really make soft power more important to the conduct of successful foreign policy. And the first is the rise of networks and, and this has sort of been, it's been brought about primarily because power is, is becoming more diffuse. So power is moving, we're seeing it move from west to east, uh, but it's also moving away from governments altogether towards more non-state actors. Um, and even the trend of urbanization is now we've reached a point in human history where more people live inside of cities than live outside of them. We see cities starting to throw their weight around on the global stage. So the, the C40 group of mayors who are working to impact the climate change debate is a good example of sort of non-nation state governments um, getting involved in, in global affairs. So the, the, the second mega trend is, is almost going to sound cliche, um, but it's the fact that the world is increasingly playing out in a, in a digital space. Um, and obviously technological revolution is part of that um, and the proliferation of platforms to, uh, to, to, to share information, to publish. Um, it's, it's made for a much more complex uh, landscape. And, and what, with, with both of these trends coming together, um, what we essentially see is that doing things unilaterally, just one country or one government trying to affect change or get things done is increasingly difficult. And it requires collaboration and cooperation and, and soft power is what helps drive collaboration and attracts actors together, whether they're government actors or, or non-state actors. Um, so the framework itself, I mean, I suppose the question is if, you know, if, if we know what soft power is and why it's important, um, why did we try to measure it? Um, well, Joseph Nye's work, he, he outlines a model of, of conversion of soft power uh, from, from resources essentially to eventual influence. And it starts with resources and while we've seen soft power has grown in popularity in terms of speeches or policy papers or op-eds in newspapers, that growth of popularity hasn't necessarily been matched by a growing understanding of soft power from governments or, or growing capability of using it. And understanding what resources a country has to work with is really the first step uh, towards using soft power. Um, so we set out to try and get over this first hurdle uh, of measurement and, and meet this measurement challenge and we've done a lot of work on this and I can say measuring soft power is very difficult. I mean we think, we think we've, we've gone pretty far in doing it. We certainly don't think it's perfect what we've created but it's a start. Um, and I, just the main thing to say about soft power, it's the, there's a lot of factors that go into it and in trying to measure it. Um, it's inherently subjective and it's also context dependent as well. So what attracts in Paris might repel in Riyadh um, as Joseph Nye has said. Um, so what is the soft power 30? It is essentially a composite index. It's a, a, a group of indicators, uh, just over 65 of them that are all brought together. Uh, it combines both objective data and subjective international polling data. Uh, it's a framework for comparing the relative strengths and weaknesses of a country's soft power resources. And I suppose the big disclaimer, uh, the, the word of warning is that it's not a measure of overall influence. Um, this is really about, it's more of a measure of potential for influence. It's about the resources uh, a country has to work with. It's then up to governments to try and use that. Um, so just very quickly, as I said, the, the index is broken up into objective data and subjective data and this is the framework of the objective uh, metrics and so there are six different essentially sub-indices uh, or categories of metrics that, that go into the objective side of the, of the index uh, and we start with Joseph Nye's three pillars of culture, of government and foreign policy and we expand on that. Um, with education, looking at factors of higher education and how globally engaged a country's higher education system is. And then we also look at enterprise, which is essentially how attractive is a country's economic and business model and, and its relative capacity for, for innovation as well. Kind of what is, what is the, the business and innovation contribution a country is making to the global community. 
and very importantly, the, the final component to this was uh, a digital sub index as well, but Elizabeth is going to touch on that in, in just a moment, so I'll leave that to her. And then on the, on the subjective side, uh, we, we ran international polling across seven different categories, looking at things from uh, a country's culture, the attractiveness of its culture, to uh, you know, the attractiveness of its foreign policy or whether anyone would want to live there. And that subjective data came from polling that was done across 20 different countries. Uh, we got a pretty good representative sample of, of the world uh, and polled just over, as I said, yeah, just over 7,000 people. And so this is the combined framework, like I said, bringing together objective and, and subjective data. Uh, and just, I won't dwell on the results all that long, uh, but just wanted to, to go over them. Um, so the top five wound up being uh, the UK coming top, then Germany, the US, France, and Canada. Uh, and Poland came in uh, 24th, uh, which actually for sort of a central or Eastern European country that had been previously behind uh, the, the Iron Curtain, um, Poland did the best of, of that set. And what I should say is that we actually collected data on 50 countries, but we only published the, the top 30. So I think saying Poland came 24th out of 50 sounds a bit better. It certainly means that Poland was in the, the, the top half of, of all the countries that we collected data for. Um, so just really quickly, this is very, very top line findings of, uh, of how Poland did and what its relative strengths and, and, and weaknesses were. And what we found in, in the, uh, uh, using the index is that, that Poland's three strongest categories, at least on the objective data, uh, were education, government, and, and engagement. And engagement is the sort of foreign policy looking at what is their kind of global footprint. And then, I wouldn't necessarily say weaknesses, but let's say areas for development. Um, what we found is that enterprise and culture were the areas where, where Poland, we think, could do a bit better. Now, it's important to say this is, this is not, I'm, I'm in no way suggesting that um, uh, um, Poland does, you know, weak on culture. Poland has fantastic culture. But this is more about to what extent is contemporary culture of Poland cutting through and, and reaching global audiences. Um, that is really difficult to, say, to see, but basically I just wanted to finish on um, a map and you can see virtually none of the map. The only bits that you can see are the only countries that Britain throughout its cumulative history has not invaded um, or colonized or been at war with. Um, so Britain has an incredibly belligerent history over the course of its existence and yet uh, people still tolerate Britain as a country and they, they even like it a bit. And, and so just in sort of tongue cheek way to say that British soft power has managed to kind of overcome this horribly belligerent history um, and to be you know, fairly well admired country. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Elizabeth to talk a bit about uh, the digital component of this research and, and uh, give some practical takes as well on, on digital diplomacy and what it means for soft power. Fabulous. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, you know, I can't help but uh, walk in this kind of building that's been repurposed so well and think how fascinating it would be to have an architecturalist here on the panel to talk about the way that architecture and soft power go hand in hand, um, especially when we think about the countries in the top five. Um, it's really wonderful uh, to have an opportunity to be here. I hope after the session we'll be able to meet um, some of you in, uh, in the audience today. As Jacob mentioned, I'm uh, Elizabeth Linder. I'm Facebook's politics and government specialist. So my job really is to train politicians and government officials on how to use Facebook to connect uh, directly to people. Um, I've been at uh, Facebook um, for seven years, um, which means by now I've been at the company longer than 99% of current employees, which is very difficult to believe. Um, and these seven years have taken me to 45 different countries um, to, to work with, with politicians. One of the countries that had the um, greatest impact on me uh, was actually um, an outreach trip that I did a while back to Moldova. I sat down with uh, the deputy speaker um, of, of parliament there, wonderful politician. And um, when I was in her office, she was showing me her Facebook page on her iPad. And she was scrolling through her page and the updates uh, that she had recently made and some of the comments. And she looked at me and she said, you know, Elizabeth, one of the things I love most uh, on my Facebook page is uh, when I sit down on my sofa in the evenings 
and I see that people have come to actually criticize or critique my points of view. And the reason I love that so much is that for so long in my country, uh, people were trained not to openly criticize uh, a public authority, that it means my little country is coming a very long way. Um, that story stuck with me so much that day, and it, it still does, because I think that gets to uh, the real power of um, global connectivity, um, whether it's in a domestic context or an international context. Um, the ability to use technology um, to power the soft power of relationships between people and between nations um, is absolutely incredible. Um, and it's something that we're definitely seeing play out here, uh, you know, in, in Poland, in, in Europe, but also uh, around, around the world. Um, Jonathan's report, as you know, for the first time ever, includes digital metrics. And it's a perfect time um, to be doing that because we actually uh, were able to get some data science um, researchers from Facebook to help us do that. Um, I wanted to spend just a moment going through uh, the, the two types of digital metrics that the report includes under the, under the digital um, side. The first uh, looks um, at uh, connectivity. So how well connected uh, is a, a country, for example, um, in, in digital terms? Uh, last week, um, I was in um, Kinshasa, Congo, and I was reminded by spending time in an unconnected country how much more difficult it is to be part of the global soft power game. Um, because it's so much more difficult to get your messages out, to attract foreign students to your universities, um, to engage in global conversations if people are so isolated from each other and from the world. And so Jonathan's report um, takes a look at that as one of the core areas for digital diplomacy. Um, but the second piece um, takes a much more specific look at how technology is playing into diplomacy today. Uh, so what we did, for example, at Facebook is we took a look at Facebook pages uh, from heads of state, uh, from ministries of foreign affairs, and we looked at the percentage of people who were connected to those pages at a domestic level versus an international level. Because of course the more people from outside that country that are connected to your head of state, the more that indicates uh, the, the presence uh, that individual has on the global stage. A classic example of this would be Angela Merkel, um, who is largely seen uh, globally <clears throat> as a figurehead for, for Europe. And then we took into account engagement as well of these people. How engaged are you in that page? So that we weren't looking just at somebody who had maybe liked a page once and completely um, forgotten about it. Um, we hope this is the beginning uh, of the research we do in this space. We considered so many options uh, with our data scientists on how we could measure soft power, and I think this is just the beginning of uh, where we'll be able to take the report um, in, in the future. One of the reasons I think it's so important to look at Facebook specifically uh, when it comes to global soft power uh, is Facebook has done something which no other company has done in the history of the world. Um, and that's connecting 1.5 billion people, which is a figure that's obviously growing. Um, our research shows that within 15 minutes of waking up in the morning, uh, anyone who owns a smartphone will check that phone. And I think most of us think, wait, it takes 15 minutes to check your phone? Usually it takes the first 30 seconds after your alarm goes off. Um, and of those people who use smartphones, Facebook is the third most utilized service after calling and text messaging. So the relevance of Facebook to a connected world um, is huge, and that's what we're looking to better understand um, through doing this uh, report. Um, when we take a look specifically at what's going on in the digital diplomacy space, uh, which is a space obviously Jacob and I spend a lot of our time in, um, we see quite a few interesting trends. 
Um, two of the trends that we looked at specifically in the report uh, come from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in, in Germany. Uh, the minister has been very actively engaging in Facebook question and answer experiences so that he's coming to Facebook to answer people's questions um, about what the ministry is doing. Um, here actually in Poland, we're seeing leading up to the elections that Facebook Q&As have been incredibly popular from party leaders. Um, and so it will be interesting to see moving forward uh, how that experience translates into Poland representing itself in a soft power in a digital diplomacy context um, beyond a national election um, context. Uh, we also took a look at, uh, at what is commonly referred to as the Modi effect. Um, Neandra Modi has a very interesting presence on Facebook in that his presence has a direct impact on other um, heads of state and foreign leaders. What I mean by that is uh, Modi's Facebook page is of course one of the biggest Facebook pages from a politician globally. And when he travels, which he has done quite a bit since assuming uh, office, we will actually see a spike um, in likes on the Facebook page of the dignitary that Modi is visiting. Um, so as he travels around the globe, foreign um, officials will see their Facebook pages uh, engagement and number of likes go up as a result of the Modi um, visit. And it's fascinating for us at Facebook to watch this behavior and see how uh, Modi's soft power, how Indian soft power actually impacts another country or head of state. Um, and of course, you know, here in Poland, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is very active um, on um, examining digital diplomacy, understanding what it means. Um, they have actively brought together some of their top diplomats from around the world um, to do direct trainings uh, with Jacob and me to understand all of our latest tools. Um, very active on, on Twitter. Uh, the Deputy Minister of, uh, of Foreign Affairs has announced his Facebook Q&A, which is coming up in the coming days. Um, so we're really seeing a lot of uh, emerging activity in this space as well. That's a brief overview on the digital side of the report. And so now we'll turn it over to Jacob and the panel to discuss further. And so my question would be how, if at all, soft power tools can help nation states to um, maybe regain some sort of global power or at least uh, yeah, try to make things clearer for uh, their citizens. Mm. So you've actually, you've hit upon what is kind of a, a paradox of the report, right? right. Because we, we do argue that um, power is moving away from states and that non-government actors are, are becoming more influential on the world stage. And yet we've, we've created an index which is, the focus is on the nation state, it's on governments, right? And, and the entire report is through that lens of governments. And what I would say is that definitely governments are, are losing power as non-state actors become uh, more influential, but they're still the, the primary actors, um, even even if they're not, they're certainly not the only actors. And there's, as, as an example of, of how governments can can do this well, they, they have to work with non-state actors. So, um, in 20, 2013, I think it was the the UN Small Arms Trade Treaty um, was pushed through by a number of governments, um, but there were a number of of non-state actors involved. So, you know, Amnesty International was working hand in hand with a number of governments, particularly the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in the UK. Usually, the Amnesty International is sort of criticizing the British government and the FCO, but this is an example of when they could actually find something where their interests are aligned and they could use the strengths of both to, to work together to, to bring about some, some change. Um, so I think uh, it's, it's important to understand increasingly the role that non-state actors have and, and the extent to which the governments can, can work with them, I suppose. But um, they're still the primary actors, even though you know, that they are losing power and influence, certainly. Um, Christoph. What are your thoughts about it? Do you think that um, all the soft power tools that we have, also the new soft power tools that we have, 
uh, are in any way uh, or can be in any way of help for nation states and their regaining of power, if needed. Okay, thank you. A very good afternoon and thank you for having me. Obviously, congratulations for this uh, Eurodonite and, and inspiring report and piece of work which you have done, guys. I mean, it's very, very, um, um, really good read. Well, I guess that, you know, trying to answer your question is that one needs to remember that, that power is a, a very relational context. We call it context. We call it Jesus, sorry for that. Um, um, concept. Uh, power is something to be exercised, whether it's soft power or hard power, is, is something to be exercised always within the relation. And if you think about the classics of philosophy or classics of, of war, of uh, uh, something which is um, um, a science on international relations, you would find that uh, everyone was talking about power being something which allows you to impose uh, what you want to achieve within the relation. So there is, there is this concept that power happens always within the relation, and you need to understand that it's always relational. So it doesn't not necessarily mean that if someone is regaining, is, is gaining in power, is being leveraged in a sense in a position of power, that the other side is losing. Because power is something which is not a fixed amount of something. So what you see, you see the shifts in this relative position of power, whether it's a soft power or hard power. So in a sense, what we, are, what we have been seeing over the last uh, um, two or three decades is actually new actors being leveraged via digital, for example, in the sense that whether individuals or groupings of people or institutions are being enabled and encouraged to exercise their agency. And this is something which is very, very important because these are new actors which are being enabled to act. And very often what we see is also, and, and we talk about this about this, this this morning, this is something which Hannah Arendt was talking about in terms of collective action as a form of power. And we have seen it in the Arab Spring, we have seen this also in, in Russia when the Russians took to the streets after the, the previous elections. We have seen this in Poland when people took to the streets when they were opposing actor regulations. So this agency is something which, uh, which makes um, uh, power and soft power so, uh, so important uh, relatively. So in this sense, obviously, the soft power which has been now made available to some new actors um, has been reshaping the relationship between the individuals and groups and the state, for example, and we have seen this in case of Snowden, for example, or Wikileaks. Uh, but it does not necessarily mean that the states are less powerful. So it's not that simple. Um, then one more thing, which if I may uh, say something. We have been living in a world which we describe in various terms, whether it's multipolar, or there are people who say that we live in a world which actually consists of various uh, worlds which are parallel, parallel spaces. People would use the language like pre-modern, modern, post-modern. Post uh, others would use the language uh, of uh, hybrid history or, uh, or linear history. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is that, that power operates in these various worlds or spaces in a different way because the contexts are simply different. So when we have this conversation about soft power and the way it operates, when the states can effectively use the soft power to regain their position, they would definitely uh, meet various barriers in these various ways because power is not something only which we have to offer. It's not only the, the supply side. It's not that we have some assets in Poland and we can offer them as, a, as our soft power because even if we manage to convert them into something really like a compelling narrative, but there is a demand side. There is the quality and taste 
which the others, the recipients, are looking for. And obviously, it sort of, in a sense, is, is illustrates also the same dilemmas which business have. It's not only enough to have a good product. You know, this product needs to sort of ring the bell on the other side. There needs to be a need for this conversation. So I guess that we are, when we are getting into this soft power conversation, uh, we are immediately getting into a very complicated and, and very matrix-like way of, of, uh, of thinking. Right, thank you very much for this. Um, so I, I'd like to continue about the soft power in the nation states. Um, on one hand, we see in this report that soft power is something that is more and more important. But still, on the other hand, when you look at global affairs and on what countries are more and more, um, let's say, on the top of the scene, we see countries such as, for instance, Russia or China, from which we cannot necessarily say that soft power is their like, primary tool of, the, of diplomacy, right? Um, that's a bit of a paradox. Um, how would you explain it? Maybe uh, I would ask the question to, to the question to Sylvie. Um. Um, China does try soft power with the um, Confucius Institute, but that's quite interesting because it's not working <laughs> very well. Uh, they are really spending a lot of money on those institutes. Um, mostly to teach Chinese, uh, and a lot of people around the world now want to learn Chinese. So I think in this respect they are succeeding, but uh, in the way of projecting Chinese culture and, and Chinese image, I don't think it's a big success, that's true. So why I think there is, and Russia, um, Russia is not even trying, I would say. Uh, or if they're trying with RT, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not, definitely not the right way to do it. But what I mean is that maybe there's something very simple um, at the bottom of this, which is democracy. Um, you know, how do you, 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 soft power cannot be just projected by force. I mean, it's a kind of oxymoron. So uh, you have to be attractive. Uh, to project soft, to project your image. And if you look at India, I was talking about India earlier because I was there a couple of weeks ago. India is really in Indian officials and Indian thinkers, you know, in think tanks, including in official circles, they're all at the moment thinking about what should we do? Is it soft power our priority or is it hard power? And actually the soft power of India is extremely powerful is very important. It's, uh, it's the biggest democracy in the world, it's yoga, it's Bollywood, it's high tech, you know, Silicon Valley wouldn't function without Indian brains, I think. Um, so uh, the soft power of India is very important, yet India doesn't see itself yet, or I mean they, they are a big power but not of course as big as China. Why? Because they have, the, 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 the GDP is only a fraction of the Chinese um, GDP. So um, you have hard power like the military power of Russia. Um, you have the economic power which is the biggest uh, instrument of power for China, I would say. Uh, China is also spreading, its, uh, using its military power, but I would, I would say um, the economic power is still the, the main instrument of power. And then you have soft power for India. And mind you, India also has hard power. They have, a big, um, they have big military forces. They are very active in, in space also. Um, though that may count as soft power, is it? Space, uh, sp yeah. but anyway. So, um, you know, Power is, is um, distributing, distributed in, in various uh, forms and shapes, but I think being a democracy um, is still a very important criteria also for the way you can project and exercise power uh, in the world and for your image.
That's, yeah, that's very interesting. Maybe I will ask the same question to Jonathan, but um, focusing maybe a bit more on Russia. Um, Sylvie, you just said that soft power kind of goes with democracy. Um, what about negative soft power? Um, and especially in the digital field. What about countries that use uh, tools that may be wonderful, also in trolling and stuff like this? I mean, you touch upon this topic in the, in the report. Um, to what extent it's really important, in a, for instance, for Russia today? So Russia, I think, there was a period where they, they were sort of mirroring what the Chinese were doing and they were talking about soft power and wanted to do this and invested in, in the Russian equivalent of Confucius Institutes, the, the Mir Ruski um, centers or foundations, I can't quite remember what they are. Um, and there was a kind of attempt at that and then I think that the powers that be in Russia sort of realize this isn't working, never mind. And what they've moved to is essentially using some soft power tools like RT, like Russia Today, like, um, like plenty of social media channels as well, to essentially put out a, 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 a counter narrative to, if we want to be really critical, a counter narrative to the truth, um, or at least putting out a narrative that is from their perspective and hoping to find, and I think these audiences do exist. There, there is a ready-made RT audience, it, not just in the sort of old Soviet sphere or in the non-Western world, but even in the Western world, there are people who will lap up that kind of counter-narrative. Um, so they're using some of these tools. And, and actually, you know, I talked earlier about the, the, the megatrends that, that make soft power more important. I've been talking about this for you know, a number of years now, and one of the things I always used to say was that um, transparency in the, in the digital revolution has essentially rendered propaganda dead and, and useless. I don't think that anymore, unfortunately. I mean, for propaganda to be truly effective, you have to control all means and all mediums of information, right? So the Chinese, within the borders of China, they can do that pretty well because they can turn off some of the internet and they control all the flows of information. Um, but Russia is essentially trying to do that for the whole world. Um, and they're doing it with various, various levels of success, but it, you know, they are essentially practicing propaganda 2.0, 3.0, whatever we're on now. Um, but propaganda is not dead. I, I wish it were, but it's definitely not. Um, and what I would say in terms of the, the soft power versus hard power, I mean, it is a, power is a spectrum, and soft power is well suited to certain issues or certain objectives. So, for example, to stay on the Russia theme, using soft power, you're probably not going to be able to convince one country to give up part of their territory to yours. That's still a hard power play. <laughs> I mean, that would be some incredible use of soft power. <laughs> you could try. You, you, probably, you probably won't get it done. That, that's, that's a hard power only um, kind of issue or objective. Um, so so it, it depends what, you know, what are you trying to achieve. And once you've worked out what your objectives are, then you can work out what kind of power is, is most likely to help you achieve those aims. But, but yeah, to just finish on the Russia point, I think they're, they're using what we would describe as soft power tools to complement their, their leveraging of hard power. All right, thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, please, Sylvie, of course. Yeah, I, I, may, if I can follow up on this, um, I, you mentioned the Arab Spring earlier, and there you have a very good uh, example of um, the power of digital revolution and how it redistributed the power. Of course, you know, the democrat huge democratization of power through the digital revolution. But at the same time, the governments using hard power can get this back and steal it from, from, from the people. So that's, that's what we have seen in, in many uh, Arab countries after the Arab Spring, particularly in Egypt, for instance. Uh, but that's, we've also seen that in uh, many autocratic countries like Iran, like China, like Russia, you know, this uh, uh, permanent game of cat and mouse, uh, of people trying to use the power, the digital power um, and, and government and police forces trying to uh, reconquer, reconquer it, reconquest. 
Reconquest, yes, reconquest. So um, this, I don't think this this balance has been solved yet. It's a, it's a, it's a con it's a continuing struggle. Right. Um, yeah. Pl pl please, please. Yeah, if, if I may on, on this one, uh, I mean, uh, I'm tr trying to challenge uh, a bit myself, and also uh, I'll be trying to stir up a bit of some more controversy about it because I'm, I'm, you know, I can see that, that obviously when we talk about soft power, we we sort of uh, uh, Eurocentric a bit, I think, or Western centric in a sense that we always think that soft power is something for which which needs to be used for the good causes, but obviously soft power and the power per se. Uh, it's neither good or bad, it's, it's just a power, a will to power. It can be abused and misused also for something which we would, uh, would consider a bad cause. And, and I can see that there are actors and agents who have been extremely successful in, in our rationality, misusing and abusing this power. And you know, let me mention uh, Russia, we discussed this issue today. I mean, something which we call Russian propaganda has been actually a, a big misuse of the soft power. I mean, the the uh, things which we have been exposed in Europe over the last uh, a couple of years in terms of Russian propaganda, internet trolling, and all this kind of stuff, uh, and influencing the media with the content that we generated uh, via the means and assets of soft power of Russia is, is one of those examples. And then look at the other uh, uh, side. Uh, there is an ISIS or Daesh, if you want, and these guys, they have been extremely uh, successful if in using soft power to attract uh, new uh, fighters, uh, to attract uh, attention clients uh, for the assets which they are selling and uh, resources. So it's obviously we look at this in terms of abuse and misuse of power, but this is also an example of how the agency enabled and encouraged actually is distributed amongst all of the agents. It's not only all those who want to use the power, soft power for the good, good causes. And, and the last uh, uh, but not uh, um, uh, uh, least thing, I think that th there is also something about the conversion and the, you actually you have been uh, uh, politically incorrect enough in not only uh, measuring the soft power but also um, discussing in the how to have soft power kind of a guide in the second and third chapter of the report to, to actually uh, advise countries how to actually go about creating soft power. And, and this is something which is very important. You can have assets, um, you can try to converge them into something which is a compelling narrative and it doesn't really need to work. So that's, that's a very complicated uh, uh, story and I think that it's also worth touching, but I'll, I'll stop there now. But precisely about all these advices that uh, are already given in the report, uh, I'd like to now come back to a kind of a more local perspective and talk a little bit about Poland and about where we are here uh, when it comes to, to soft power. So, of course, we have uh, Lech Wałęsa, the Pope, and our Pierogi. Uh, but um, is it used efficiently enough to really create some um, global diplomacy? Um, Krzysztof, what are your views about how we, as Poles, uh, use soft power tools, culture, to go global in our diplomacy? Well, that's a tricky one. I would follow the, uh, the advice from the authors and I would assess uh, our assets and I would try to understand uh, how they can really resonate uh, on the other side where the demand for the stories, good stories, uh, is. But, uh, but seriously, uh, I, I think that Poland still has been somehow digesting its own success. And uh, we are still at the very early stage of assessing where the assets which we have or we have developed over the last few years, going through the primary modernization of the country and getting rid of the primary deficits, uh, what, how we can actually, uh, uh, how we can create this narrative, uh, in other words, how we can produce some soft power. Um, this is something uh, which we are uh, still, I think, uncertain, and you can see that we have been trying, we have tried on various occasions, uh, very skillfully, sometimes in a very smart way, we use various communication occasions and opportunities, like 
sport events and this kind of stuff, and also some political events uh, to to tell the story about uh, new successful Poland uh, to various audiences in Europe and, and outside Europe. But we still need to develop an appetite for what we need our soft power. And this is uh, something which uh, actually goes back to the very political uh, um, fundamental discussion. Um, and I have this, this quote from one of our former ministers. I would not name the gentleman, but um, uh, just uh, ascribe the licentia poetica to him. He, he comes up with this uh, very sort of really, I, I think, uh, good uh, um, uh, saying that, you know, the biggest, the biggest challenge for the Poles is, is to answer the, the very simple question, uh, what, what God has created Poles for? And this is the question, I mean, as, as soon as we answer this question, we will understand what we uh, want to use uh, soft power, if any we have, uh, for what purposes. That's a good question indeed. <laughs> um, Elizabeth, you've been in Poland quite some times these past month. Um, you also have a wonderful international experience, so um, I guess you can benchmark, in a way, Poland versus other uh, countries. Um, so, yeah, what's your view about it? And maybe to this question I would add uh, another one. Uh, what is the importance of scaling different initiatives in a country so that it's seen really abroad? So I have the feeling in Poland that there is a lot of stuff done, but sometimes it kind of goes in different directions, and therefore when you're far from Poland, you just don't see it. So, yeah, what's your view on it? Yes, um, it seems rather appropriate to come to an American after asking the question, what did God create us for? Americans love answering that question. I think we do it a bit too much. Um, yeah, so it's, it's fascinating. I mean, Poland, from my perspective, and of course I'll focus on the digital side of, of soft power here. Um, some of you uh, may know, but many of you might not know, uh, that when Facebook recently launched its first ever live video experience, um, Andre Duda, the president uh, here, uh, was the first um, politician globally to use and embrace that tool, uh, which is incredible. So what we're seeing on, you know, here in Poland is an incredible use of um, digital tools, of embracing some of these new tools. I spoke about the Facebook Q&A. Um, but live videos, I mean, if you, if you go to Duda's page now and just scroll around, you'll see uh, they're, they're all over. Um, so that's really quite remarkable. I think the phase that we're in here is definitely a phase of understanding how to interpret um, offline soft power as a different thing from online soft power. Uh, so, for example, a number of the Facebook pages here will simply post news articles um, from the, you know, from the, the newspaper world or will post a photo of uh, two dignitaries shaking hands. That's soft power in an, in an offline um, context, but that's not really what online soft power is, you know, is, is meant to be doing. Um, it's just simply taking one thing and putting it on another platform rather than reinventing what this is all about. Um, I think in the next few years, we're going to see, hopefully, um, ministry, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and government offices understand um, digital diplomacy is actually part of the policy-making, decision-making machine. So that rather than Facebook pages that are run by junior staff, you actually have Facebook pages that are also overseen by senior officials who use the comments, who use the commentary, who use the question and answers to inform uh, their top leadership as to um, public opinion. And there's actually a very specific section in the report that, that looks at this transition. What does digital diplomacy actually mean? Um, the, the piece I would focus on as well is if you look at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Poland, and this gets to the second piece of your question, um, they're extremely good um, at, for example, setting up you know, Twitter pages. Um, they're less good at setting up Facebook pages for their embassies abroad. 
Now the thing is, you know, we all know that Twitter tends to reach a more, uh, a smaller audience, but that's more educated. Whereas Facebook is reaching a bigger audience that's everybody from the highly educated all the way through to people who maybe, you know, don't go to university, but are still components of the global society and of the people soft power is reaching, especially in the context of, um, you know, finding opportunities for people to contribute to, to the global um, economy. So I think that that's definitely an, an area for growth here is speaking beyond the bubble. You know, Jonathan and I know the discussion around soft power and digital diplomacy is often the same people talking to each other. And so what the opportunity to use Facebook a bit better by the foreign missions here, by the embassies here, um, is going to bring in a much wider group of society. And I'm certainly seeing that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here through training its staff um, through bringing people here um, to, to Poland from its missions abroad to amp up the level of service they're giving to their foreign um, uh, you know, presences will hopefully help in that effort. Right, so uh, there's still a lot to be done in a way. <laughs> um, I would like now to take the opportunity, I mean we have the great pleasure to have Sylvie with us today. Um, so I'd like to take the opportunity to talk about another European country, which for me, I must admit, is some sort of a paradox. Uh, of course, I'd like to talk about France. So on one hand, it's a country that throughout history, I have the feeling always used soft power in a wonderful way. Uh, I can talk about French cuisine, wines, uh, culture, whatsoever. But on the other hand, we see that today, they kind of have troubles to find a place in this new global surrounding, also from a digital perspective, right? So we have a country that has all the tools, in a way, but that, like, kind of lost the way to use them. Um, first of all, do you agree? And if so, um, what's the reason? Do I agree? Um, yes and no. I mean, uh, you, you describe France as a country of soft power, which is true because everybody knows Versailles, Chanel, and Champagne. But um, France likes to think of itself also as a country of hard power. Um, so, like, um, it's a big nuclear, it's a nuclear power, it's a big user of nuclear energy also. <laughs> uh, we, um, it, it has, it's very, it has an, uh, it has armed forces which are heavily engaged in several countries at the moment. I forgot the number, but it's more than 10. Uh, in some countries, in, including in combat. Uh, it's also involved in the Middle East. It's along the, the US um, in, you know, bombing campaigns in Syria and so on, though I don't think it, it's as active as the US, but it's, it is officially and actively engaged. So um, it's, it's a mix. Now, is the soft power as efficient as it used to be? Maybe not, you're right. But I think there we touch another, another problem, which is the economy, and we go back to this economic power. Why, you know, uh, France is at the moment in a, in a period of economic weakness, um, especially compared to its big neighbor on the east, Germany, and its major partner in the EU. There's also this dimension that France is not a power by itself anymore. France is increasingly acting within the EU. You know, it's difficult, as you know very well, in Poland. It's um, the EU is still a work in progress, it's frustrating, it's uh, painstaking, it takes ages to get to a decision because it's 20, 28 member states. But France is, one, is of course one of the founding members and also one of the main actors along with Germany. So um, this is also, I think, this impression, this explains, in my view, this impression, which is not only an impression, it's a reality that France is not at the top of its form, because Germany at the moment is so powerful economically, uh, and France is still struggling with structural reforms and you know the, the high unemployment level, and so so 
the, the, the couple, the, the famous French-German couple is totally unbalanced at the moment. Um, but so, you know, I, I think this feeds the impression that France is not a leading power, but I don't see why France should be a leading power. It's a middle power, uh, which is trying to act within a new power, which is the e European Union, um, with all the difficulties that it implies. So um, Germany, because this would be the comparison we have to the benchmark, since you, were, you used this word earlier, uh, Germany is having another moment. Germany is having a very powerful economic moment, uh, but it's, it's very uncertain about where it's going with, his hard power, with its hard power. Does it have to, uh, you know, it's very reluctant to use hard power when France is, you know, very happy to use hard power. And you can see this also in public opinions. You know, there is, uh, the French public opinion is very divided on a lot of issues, but on foreign policy, on defense, on security, it's totally, I mean, it's very united, I think. Uh, it's consensual, including politically. So these are, you know, these are two, um, two different countries which work together within a bigger group, but which have, of course, uh, different um, uh, forces, diff different ways to use their power, and also different mentalities, I think, and different dynamics. Yeah. Because you could say 15 years ago that Germany was not at the top of its form, so it it's varies, yeah. Right, um, I'd like to continue with Jonathan. So, Sylvie, you linked um, soft power with economic uh, kind of strength. Um, what do you think about it? Maybe taking the example of, um, of France, as I indeed think it's a good one here. Um, and then maybe a second question would be, uh, Sylvie said that indeed France is also, and maybe most importantly, part of Europe. Um, did you have the opportunity to analyze European soft power? Um, does it make sense to talk about such a thing as a European soft power today? So, the, the first question is the role of economics in, in, in soft power. So, I guess what I would say is, it's not about, volume of economic output. So, so Sylvia, you said I think the, the China's power is based on the size of its economy, and that's very true. But when it comes to soft power, the role of, 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 of the economy in soft power is economic sophistication rather than economic volume. So a country like Switzerland is still in the top 10. Right? It's, it's small, you know, its GDP isn't huge, but it's incredibly sophisticated as an economy. Or Singapore does very well, and it's, what, 6.5 million people. Very sophisticated economy. It's very attractive to businesses, it's very attractive to entrepreneurs. They're producing things that, you know, these, these sophisticated countries are producing things that we need, uh, that we want. Um, to go back to the dem demand versus supply side, you know, you have to have things that actually people want. Um, so I would say that's the role of, of economics. So, oh, you know, hard power, you kind of have to have some level of hard power to have soft power. Um, but when it comes to the economy, it's about sophistication rather than volume. Um, and the second question. About the European Union. European Union, thank you, yeah. So what, what we didn't look specifically at the European Union. Uh, what, I mean, we did look at um, essentially a membership of, of international organizations. So how well connected uh, are different countries? How many clubs are they a member of? How many, how many friends do they have? So in that sense, um, we kind of picked that up. We recognize it's important to be part of networks and international organizations. Um, it's a good question, the European Union soft power, and um, there's a think tank in, in Spain, um, whose name is escaping me right now, Ocano, yeah. Yeah. maybe? And they do a global, um, global presence index, which is, which is a really interesting study as well. And, and there are elements of soft power and there are elements of hard power, and it, it looks at how, how well do countries project themselves in, in, through all spectrums of, of power. And they include the European Union within that, and the European Union actually comes top, um, you know, higher than the US. 
So by, by that metric, you could say, you know, it is a major player, and, and I, I would say it was. I think it's difficult for the European Union to kind of, especially when we think of the cultural elements of soft power, what is European culture? You know, that, that's kind of hard. I mean, I think the European Union can define itself very strongly, very compellingly, by saying it's a sense of shared values uh, around, you know, more or less a liberal economic um, structure, human rights, democracy. Shared values is, is, is to me, is, is European Union soft power and, and values that we can all more or less get behind. But to answer the question about specifically what did we do in the study on the European Union, we didn't do anything to sort of try and aggregate that, but, but maybe something to think about in the future. Just, just one thing, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I was in India recently and we asked um, uh, Indian officials what could they, what, what is Europe for them, what does it mean for them, and we were very disappointed quite often by the answers. But one thing they said they could, uh, they said Europe, apart from the trade issues, of course, you know, but uh, one thing uh, they said Europe could help them. Uh, one field in which uh, Europe could help them, and you're going to be scared to death there, is regulation. And they, say, and they say you are doing very you're you're doing you're good at regulation. For instance, on data protection, <laughs> um, you know you are doing interesting things, and um, you know this is something maybe where we could uh, try to cooperate. So. Um, you know, you have, of course, the euro, which at the moment is, may not be the best uh, thing to sell abroad, the best example to sell abroad, though it's still standing and it's still working, even though it was, uh, uh, its collapse was forecast many times. But, you know, there are other areas of, of, of Europe, uh, other than shared values, uh, which is true, or, or a culture, uh, that can be uh, appealing in terms of soft power. Please. Well, just just to remind you about the soft power stuff, uh, um, I I don't want to discuss whether soft power is the same thing like, civili like civilizational attractiveness or whatever you call it. But if I may remind you that the influx of refugees, economic migrants, is still coming into Europe, not outside Europe. It says it tells you something. Um, uh, uh, there is something in here that people like and consider to be better than in some other places. And I'm not talking only about these people who have been actually escaping a serious threat of their, to their uh, lives or, or, or life. Uh, just wanted to go back for a second to, to, the, to the French uh, story and the soft power of France. Um, uh, Jacob, you, you, you speak French. I do not speak French. You are all younger than me, so things have changed for good. And this is the, the very good example how relative is the, the, uh, the uh, making and, and working of, of soft power. Um, with, with, uh, when I look into the sub indices, I can see that France has come up uh, really very nicely uh, on uh, very, very sub indices. I mean, you know, culture, education, I mean, these are the sub indices which have uh, really made uh, France a very attractive uh, country, uh, the backdrop of, of the others. Um, so, uh, just saying this because I want to say and emphasize one more time, I mean, it depends where you see it, how the soft power, uh, which you think that you have, is attractive and resonates. And I, I can see that the chap uh, found the soft power of, of the French Republic very attractive because you have learned French. I have not, somehow, but... Uh, could I um, just add, Please. going back to our question on the economy, I think one thing we haven't discussed which is worth noting um, is that many of the more traditional players in soft power um, really had to spend quite a lot of money to get there. So in a you know, pre-digitally connected era, um, you know, if, if you're a major music group, you have to actually go on tour um, to spread your soft power. Um, you know, if you're the East India Company, I mean, that's a serious investment in a business to bring teas and coffees and all of this sort of thing. If you're a champagne house, you know, you, you can't um, become a great champagne house in the world with no capital expenditure. Whereas what's interesting about the digital component of this report 
is that that's the component that really levels, I think, the playing field um, from how much you have to spend. And in fact, some of the strongest players internationally in digital spaces, I would say, are players with less money because they're more committed um, to, to use these digital tools well. And I will cite, for example, police forces. I've worked a lot with police forces, especially um, in the UK after the riots in London a few years ago. Police forces in the UK don't have a lot of money, especially not right now. But they're using Facebook very smartly to build trusted relationships with their communities in such a way that in many of these contexts, the, the police you know, has more trust on Facebook than in traditional um, contexts. Or, or, and so it's, it's just interesting to me to see where this goes because you know, um, especially I'm looking at, for example, an American perspective, our universities do very well in soft power. Well, they're quite wealthy institutions. Whereas if you're looking at a Facebook page, using a Facebook page well, um, using any digital components well, it, you know, if you're doing it in an authentic and real and exciting way, really doesn't take that much money um, to, to play with, with France, with the United States, with, with Germany, with Poland. Right, so precisely I'd like to continue on this digital topic. Um, we have here on the floor two representatives of um, this digital media platforms and of the newspaper uh, media. And so from a perspective now of policy makers, how different it is really for a politician to go and talk to its citizens using Facebook and using Le Monde or uh, the mean of journalists uh, on the other hand. I don't know, maybe Elizabeth, you could. Is there a difference really? Yeah, there, I mean, there's, there's a huge difference. Right. Um, and I think where politicians sometimes fall into the traditional trap is um, they, they will treat a Facebook page like a press conference. Um, you know, that mentality is, is dangerous on social media because it's, it's A, not what people are looking for, um, and it's B, not achieving their real objective. You know, when, when politicians are sitting down with a journalist, they're expecting to have a conversation with someone who's probably quite well informed about the topic at hand. Um, when they're turning to Facebook to do a Q&A, largely what they're doing is trying to understand what's on people's mind and what people care about. Um, so you will, I will actually see Facebook Q&As that are done specifically so that the politician and his team better understand where people are coming from because they're capturing an audience that they're not interacting with in their daily lives. Um, a lot of the people that come to ask questions of politicians are not eating at the same restaurants and speaking at the same events than the politician. And so it's a completely different, different context. Um, I encourage politicians to see Facebook as, you know, as a dinner party with, with citizens um, where they're just sitting down and having a conversation um, and, and coming at their Facebook experience in um, a less programmatic way than many of them will, will do. All right, so you would focus on the bidirectional aspect of, uh, of such a communication. Um, Sylvie, yeah. what differences I, do you see? I, I agree, of course, with, with uh, Elizabeth. Uh, I would add that um, for me the difference is that if a politician, uh, through social networks, a politician addresses directly uh, his or her voters or the citizens, you know, there's no intermediary. Um, he can address them directly, he can uh, interact with them, he can listen to them if he wants to. Uh, through a newspaper, including on online, uh, it's a different target. First, the paper selects the politician. So we don't, you know, you're a politician, you cannot just come up to uh, Le Monde or the New York Times or the Guardian and say, hey, I want to be interviewed or I want to place, I want to, you to publish a, a, an op-ed, a, a text by me. Uh, you know, they 
we usually reach out to them or they can reach out to us and we'll say no we're not interested or yes we are interested so there's this selection process which kind of uh, legitimizes the politician which you know so it's um, I think I'm not a politician and I don't have any advice to give them but I would find it, uh, to me, it would make sense to use, and most of them do actually, to use both media uh, because they are very complementary. And then, you know, with, uh, now all the newspapers also have digital operations because otherwise we would be dead by now and we would all have disappeared. Um, so you can also, through those digital operations of, of mainstream newspapers, you know, uh, interact with the audiences. We also have this kind of uh, of operations, yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm not running a newspaper and all the uh, platform, but uh, I guess that there, there, there is one or two important differences. I mean, in a sense, when you when you think about politicians uh, or diplomats coming to to any platform, whether it's uh, Facebook, Twitter, or entering into this digital world. Uh, what they are doing is actually they are arriving at someone else very often, someone else territory. It's their choice to come in and to visit. Uh, and this is an important thing. Why with the newspapers it works slightly the other way around because they need to be bought with the newspapers. So it's it's not really themselves that they are. Yeah, it's a push and pull story. It's slightly different. And obviously it creates a different communication situation and opportunity for them. So they need to uh, somehow uh, um, uh, address in a slightly different way these, these two uh, various audiences. And then I, I, wonder, uh, I wonder whether, whether internet is actually is, is not something which is really scary for the politicians and diplomats. They see more risks. And the reason behind it is, and this is my intuition, I'm speculating now, is it's that you know, with the newspaper, more or less, you can manage the risk because you know what kind of readership the newspaper or magazine has. And you can ask for all these, you know, graphs and you can see, you know, more followers of this or that and, you know, which classes and social grouping. With the uh, um, internet platform, it's like it is really diving deep waters and it's deep, you know, open water swimming because you don't know who you really uh, are going to face. And, and we obviously, we know that obviously there are misuses and abuses of, of internet spaces, but I think that this is a far risky uh, environment which hasn't been really conquered by the political class. Uh, um, uh, per se, apart from a few individuals, although it's, it's been really uh, changing. And then, I guess that the last but not least thing is, I think that they are also afraid of competition, because they know that they compete in the internet with some rock stars and uh, other interesting personalities, which uh, very often uh, have nothing to do with politics, which uh, has uh, a very poor reputation um, all over the world, to be honest with you. Actually, that's very true. Um, one thing that most politicians are surprised by uh, is in most countries with an election, um, political related topics will be the most talked about topics on Facebook that year. And in fact, we saw a few years ago that globally, um, elections related topics were the most talked about topic on Facebook. Um, so it's fascinating because I think you're exactly right. Um, I think you're, you're, you're dead on in saying that, that politicians are afraid of not being as interesting as Lady Gaga, but in reality, um, people are actually talking about politics on Facebook a, a lot, and it's really Jacob and my job to help politicians understand that so that they can get in the game. Maybe one last comment from Krzysztof, because we're running just, out just of time. Just to change a bit, yeah. and, and this is something about internet, transparency, and this kind of stuff. The, the risk with the internet is that the digital the digital trace is always there, almost always. I have been told the story about one of the European governments when the Council of Ministers was offered that all their proceedings will be actually taken in the form of, of minutes and posted on the internet immediately after the Council uh, meeting. And imagine that there was not one minister who wanted to take the floor when this new arrangement come into force. 
So the Council of Ministers, uh, instead of lasting a couple of hours, lasted 15 minutes, right? And that was the last one when the minutes were supposed to be posted on the internet. So it tells you, you know, it says all. Right, thank you very much. It's a very interesting aspect and we could continue uh, for a long time. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So, uh, and I actually am also sorry we didn't have the opportunity to open the floor to the public. Um, but yeah, thank you very, very much for this discussion. And uh, Jonathan, we hope for a second part of the report, actually. <laughs> thank you very much, for you. Thank you.